Oh, it's Diane, Diane de Prima. She's out in California now. I remember her from New York. I remember her, uh, I think the beach, maybe Kerouac, was at uh, Cooper Union. She lived right nearby. And uh, <clears throat> Ashley Montague was there, the famous anarcho psychologist, anthropologist from Princeton, or Rutgers. And uh, the beats were the subject, and uh, I remember two things there. Ashley Montague said, you have, you have to hug the beats, no matter, even if they push you away. And um, at the end, when there was, uh, Diane was in the audience, and she said, uh, she got up and she said, you think we're something. Where do you see what comes after us? And damn, if she wasn't right. And uh, this is revolting news. And uh, we're continuing. You think we're revolting? Why do what comes after? <laughs> and we're continuing with uh, my novel, The Fox. I'm Thule, Cooper Berg. And what continent are we on? We're on the, uh, it's all one continent, you know. The land masses are all joined, aren't they? Gondwana land. Especially when the Bering Straits uh, freeze over. And they were all, all joined at one time. And uh, I wonder how many thousands of years it took before someone figured out that uh, Africa fitted into the shoulder South of South America. America. Any kid could have done that. It's like uh, it was recently discovered, like within the last 25 years, that most men have erections every night. And I hope so. women could have, you know, but they didn't know that because they were asleep. But women could have told them that right. if they'd asked the women. Just ask. Just ask. They never asked. Uh, you, get, you get them during dreaming, and the first uh, way they proved this was by a very primitive technique. Uh, they took a roll of postage stamps <laughs> and uh, pasted them around a man's penis, and in the morning, the uh, stamp, the spaces between the stamps would have been broken, uh, were broken, which meant that the penis had expanded during the night. Now they have very elaborate pl plethysmographs to do that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> here we go. You learn something new every uh, week on uh, the revolting news. So the fucks are in uh, London. He, that's Yuri, visited the Imperial War Museum on Lambeth Road. Formerly the building's house Bedlam. And saw the stuffed air raid wardens and the darling large-scale model of the Battle of Masawa with each little Brit and Wop dressed so darling and the tanks so taut and the exacto landscape so desert and done and so life like death-like he loved all Londoners and thought them far and away the most gentlemanly knaves and cutthroats he had ever met. He languished long over the Blake inscription on an old church near St. James Park. The angel that presided o'er my birth said, little creature formed by joy and mirth, go love without the help of anything on earth. Finally, his time was up and regretfully he took the bus from Victoria to Heathrow and landed eight hours later in Philadelphia and rushed to the warehouse, a uh, music venue, a fire trap they, they had once refused to play in till the fire exits were unlocked. And where the fucks were due to go on in 20 minutes. Strangely, the other fucks were there, but now the front doors were locked. The front doors. It seemed that the club had closed permanently between the contract signing and the play date, and that nobody in this swine outfit had taken the trouble to notify them. Yuri had lost a whole week vacation in swinging London. He cursed his face, wept, and next day he began this poem, Longing for London. Part one, one. They say you once, oh yeah, that's uh, Strictly Kosher. That's the Peaside Bookstore on East 10th Street. That building's been torn down. 
I used to, I live up, lived upstairs. I got that place for Ed, Ed Sanders Bookstore. Uh, that's where the Fox place, the, uh, the Fox place that played their first concert. You remember that, all you listeners. And that is B and H. B and H. On Second Avenue. And the St. Mark's. The former location. Yeah, former location of St. Mark's bookstore, which is on which used to be on St. Mark's Place. You know, the University Place bookstore is on 12th Street and the Cedar Street Tavern is on uh, University, University Place. <clears throat> Longing for London. They say you once could walk across London without your feet leaving grass. I say that today you can walk across New York City without your feet once leaving shit. I walk looking for a place to sit and reminisce, which Ted says is love. Well then, I love you, London. Your promise, your elegance, your reserve, like a treasure. Two. They say the bored Britons that you're a myth. A myth is as good as a feckless smile in blood-drenched New York. How trite the PRs and the niggers fight. Cutting you too, white soul brother, incidentally. Three, class, that's what London has, reverberations. And now as I walk, even the Jeff Mark library is closed. Walk on, hippie prig, prick or priest. Begar, you're hosed and saddled with embroider, with embered freudery. A cop can knock your proud life down. Four, I think of London, I think in spire spite of class and dullness and the ghosts because of empire, the ghosts of empire dill, dillying and doll dallying and crying, city of a thousand nations, quiet city, demanding and full of mystery. History commands me. I know the society because I know the language. And London has spoke in me a million smiles. A million smiles, fires, tines, trembles, tears, and sometimes tendered love. Each echoing neighborhood, Chelsea, Kensington, dreaded Fulham and Earl's Court, they have taught me that I must return, learn to go back home again, again to yearn. So here is the entire song, a few sweet streets and girls I missed for which, for whom I long. That was written in New York, 1968. Now the second part was written in London in October. Part two, England Revisited. One, how can all the cliches be true? I am sorry, senor, but the lady she has left. Balls of empire. Three British old women in a row. District line all the way to Chiswick. Sexless, ugly, hateful. Look at their men. Brow wrinkled land. Those poor pricks ran from these dames to empire. In sexless rage, they fucked and killed the poor, and the poor, and the poor, poor wags. They fucked and killed the poor, and the poor, and the poor, poor wags. Two, your day is done, although still I see the shadowed servants crawling around your vapid movies, all perfectly acted. Especially impressive was the realism of the prison scene amidst the comedy, you know. Wow. That's W-A-U-G-H. Wow. A class society. So tight and proper. Such accents clipped and kempt. Assholes. Laughing. No talking. Gaunt against the crazy hippie in the tea shop at the Victoria and Albert. Which structure did you like best? Asked the pimple simplex student. Long pause, the proper now. Santa Sophia, I think. He thinks, 
He needs a hot poker up his ass before he'll ever feel a thing. Keep a stiff upper cock. No pound, I think he'd rather. Three. At least the Germans are vulgar and have an energy that and charms. Would you kindly move on, madam, please, in dulcet tones, said the beautiful Bobby to the small bone lady dem demonstrating in Grosvenor Square. The wily jammed her with his stiffened fingers, hard as he could, in a tender rib, a bit below her gentle breast. England! Your England! Four. And foreigners. Come to pour your blood and sweat and years, tears, who, the native slaves, all are acceptable. Especially you few rich native seduces, traduces of your own land. Compra whores, continents for sale, holy peoples one by one till we've used you up and slammed the door upon your bleeding fingers. Bye. Class, yet yeah, that's what society has and build forever in brass your signs, ordering me to watch my hands. If your shit offends you, then rip out your entrails, entrails, the signs for servants, entrances, last longer than you or your servants or the idea of servants. The train from Victoria still leaves for St. Petersburg, which I found engraved in stone on the outside walls of Victoria Station. The train from Victoria still leaves for St. Petersburg, though Lenin himself has gone to sleep with Keats. This land is mad. And though you repair and patch and paint and pair again, that which is crooked cannot be made great. England, a nation of gardens surrounded by fences. Um, the funny thing about the St. Petersburg, I was there again last year, and they, that thing that was engraved in stone it said that was the uh, uh, one of the ends of the uh, European Express from it's London. Two, two of yeah. Trains in Victoria. Oh yeah, no. It it said uh, I think it listed them like Vienna. Uh, what would the stops be? Paris. No, uh, Brussels, Paris, Vienna. Oh, yeah. Munich. Uh, Mun uh, you know, it would go Warsaw, Vienna. and Saint Petersburg was the last stop. So they got rid of that, but now they could use it again because yeah. again it's Saint Petersburg. But I have the feeling that... What was it called before Peter was around? It, he built the city. It's oh, yeah. his city. I think they're going to change it soon, though, to... Uh, you know all that discontent? I think they're going to change it to St. Leningrad. Zero Nosky Grad. Nosky? Zero Nosky, yes. Oh, Zero Nosky Grad. Part three of uh, Longing for London. The confusion resounded. The resolution revolution refounded. This is a line from uh, Blake that Ed made a song out of. Every morn and every night, some are born to sweet delight. Every night and every morn, some to misery are born. Every morn and every night, some are born to sweet delight. Every night and every morn, some to misery are born. This next is a comment on the, uh, you say you want a revolution, remember? That was a very, they were very confused. They had two versions of that song, one pro and one con. Hey, Beatles, you got, you got a great satire then on your revolutionary song. So I'm the only one to know. Say the word, the word is fuck. Say the word, the word is suck. Say the word, the word is fuck. I know the revolution's coming. I play your dong to all the cops I meet, M-I-E-T. I'm a pacifag, too. And hey, 
Like Alan said, the youth of all the world is dancing, dancing on the dead heads of their fathers. Those poor men, they died to make Victoria's fee. We have a new biology now. It spurts and dances, whirls and shoots. We're alive, man, like leaves of fire. The nation's beauty claims the earth. We want to fuck and we want it now. That and everything is all you have on earth and all you need to have. Come on. Old Mercury chased from Piccadilly and Eros. Eros is there now, holding an orgy all over the countryside, in every hand and breast and mouth, and yeah, in every stone and sexy gland, and we will dance Jerusalem in every bloody and in every greeny land. We want to fuck, and we want to... No. To fuck is to love again. Uh, this was an inter uh, uh, printed in International Times, IT, in October 1968. So even from the brink of hell, the poet snatches. So whose apartment was this? What? Who's what? Oh, I don't know. Jack Kerouac's boyhood home. Is that what it says? Old man. Is it? No kidding. No. Top floor. And uh, it was right next to the gem spa. Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't know that. No, I didn't know that. Uh, this next chapter is chapter 15 of the Fox, and it's called Off Wisconsin. Off Wisconsin. <laughs> It was, in, it was in Wisconsin that the Fucks played at, uh, in Madison. Uh, <laughs> they played at a, a U.S. armory, a National Guard armory. It was run by, uh, I guess it was run by... Uh, National Guard. Yeah. But, but no, it might have been, they might have been, somehow I get the idea, well, it was a soldier, uniformed they soldier. The, uh, they leased it to the Fugs. They didn't realize we were going to play Kill for Peace. They were very polite, though. They helped us a lot. Luckily, the sergeant didn't stay for the concert. Didn't you play in um, Appleton? Yeah. Well, this is a chapter about Appleton. Oh, okay. Appleton, Wisconsin, was a nice, clean, average American town in the nice, clean, average Fox River Valley till some ugly, scabby, hippie kids at Appleton University invited the fucks to perform there. A jolly happy time was had by all. However, once the local cop at the Red Rooster Inn, which doubled as the American Legion Hall, had to be convic convinced by Peter Mogul, who was traveling with the fucks, that he, Peter, wouldn't use any more of, quote, them words in his second set. There had been a complaint by, by an irate mother whose teenage daughter was present. And after the average performance, the fucks returned to the average wine, women, and song. Actually, Alka-Seltzer, Jerkoffs, and TV at the Appleton Stilton. Each room had the usual undistinguished and indestructible steel tube furniture and featured a large autumn scene painted on the beige wall. Yuri was surprised when he noticed the exact same painting in each of their separate accommodations. Completely red-toned in his and Charles' suite, completely green-toned in, in Red and Ben's, and all blue-toned in Larry and Dave's. They must have been made by a machine that sprayed different colored paints on electronically weighted areas. How can a nation like that fail, thought Yuri. <laughs> The next morning, Yuri slunk through Main Street, looking for a sufficiently unhostile appearing restaurant. He found one that was sort of negatively neutral and had a stack with syrup. 
not Maple. He overtipped the waitress, thankful she hadn't thrown him out. At the hotel, all were gathering for the pilgrimage to St. Mary's Cemetery, where Appleton's most famous native son, Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, lay buried. The jagged ride on the back of the pickup truck was excruciatingly cold. It was freezing. About 30 fucks and students and press people gathered round the modest grave. While in the freezing wind and beautifully laying snow, Peter and Red intoned Catholic, Jewish, and Buddhist invocations for the happy retrieval and redemption of the immortal soul of the late, ungrate Senator Joe. Books, candies, pretzels, and fresh flowers were put upon his grave, and one of the Appleton co-eds laid down the grave itself and hugged the cold earth as a symbolic ultimate sacrifice of love and redemption. The press photogs all loved that. The cops who were busy taking down license numbers could hardly contain themselves. That night, Ken Allwright, the reactionary newscaster nationally out of Chicago, intimated on nationwide TV, a group of notorious hippies had relieved themselves on Senator McCarthy's grave and suggested that local authorities might want to see if any part of the Wisconsin State Health Code had been violated. Red received a, hur a hurried call one half hour later from our friend, a local reporter. His mother had heard from a friend at City Hall that some action, police action, was being contemplated. Battle stations, the Fox Two Station Wagon Convoy, Wagon Convoy, Two Station Wagon Convoy. Uh, I, excuse me, I have to make a little correction here. We'll go to Battle stations. We'll go to a still. Oh, it's still. Uh, it's still smiling. Battle stations, the Fox 2 station wagons convoy, now containing also Frederick Taylor, the president of the Appleton Student Council, who had invited the group to perform, slithered into the dangerous night. In three hours, the Fox and Fred were all safely ensconced in a dreadfully up-to-date motel on the outskirts of Madison. All right. The desk clerk had put them in the most remote wing of his establishment. They had to walk two blocks to the motel restaurant. When they got there, they were informed that, unfortunately, the kitchen had just closed. Ben was reaching for the fire axe on the wall and saying lowly, Well, then let's open it up. <laughs> when Red grabbed his arm gently and said, Fred knew a great pizza place in town, and nice it would be to meet some college men and women, women. I never get any know-how, said Ben. But at least they have good cheese here. I think I'll take home a pound of it and do dirty things with it in the bathroom. <laughs> sex, <laughs> sex ain't everything, though, mused Ben. Yeah, added Yuri. There's also fucking. Well, anyway, said Ben, tipping up high his pint of Southern comfort. Here's to the pure memory of Senator Joseph McCarthy. Farm boy, virgin, rich man, and bigot. I know his spirit still lives on in the hard hearts of the infernal American people. Everyone said they'd all drink to that, and so they did deep into the dark hours of the student night. I remember uh, one of the great Bon Mots I picked up in the Rotskeller at uh, the student, uh, student building. Student, what do you call it? Student center? Union. Student Union, right, at, at, uh, at Madison. Someone had, someone had engraved on the wall in, uh, in glittering black, black, uh, Magic marker. Uh, I'd rather have a beer in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. <laughs> no, I'd rather have yeah, a, bottle in, a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. You got it. <laughs> what? Uh, 
How much more time do we have? Oh, hey, we got four minutes. You you were out uh, you were out with me to uh, Madison, right? Uh, like uh, Lake Mendota, yes. Yeah, you remember? Let's talk a little bit about that. You remember the madman who brought us out there? Um, the guy that put the paper mache uh, uh, replica of yeah. the life size statue. Yeah, of this guy. In the lake, yeah, he I, ran on the shovel party. He had, he graduated from school. A mad Armenian. Yeah, yeah. He now teaches math somewhere in New Jersey. Uh, Leon. Vargian. Yeah, Leon. Yeah. yeah. What he did, I remember he, um, he, uh, he ran on the shovel ticket. He enlisted for one half a course, an agricultural extension, maybe some gardening course. Yeah. And he got himself elected on the party ticket. He became vice president of the, student, uh, of the student party, which had a budget of about 150 or $200,000. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, and he instituted some uh, uh, monumental uh, programs, such as dial a joke paid for by the student union. You would call up and there was a different joke every day. And also free bowling ball washing because he, he, he uh, uh, purchased or leased a uh, bowling ball washer for the student union office. That's a good, that was a good idea. Yeah. And he said uh, uh, one of their program platforms was that they would bring the Statue of Liberty to uh, to, to Madison, Madison. and what he did was they they built a, like a five foot replica, more like ten foot or something. Yeah. Right? Well, and they only had the hand yeah, yeah. sticking out of the water of Lake Mendota. The other wonderful thing that happened, I don't know if you were there then, uh, at the student senate, a meeting of the student senate. I remember it was in some laboratory, you know, like a laboratory room with a big table up front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he went and he went opened the door and he every he gave everyone a white. Uh, frock, you know, white laboratory frock, yeah. and uh, well, the beer started to come in cases and cases of beer, and a dog came in, a wonderful dog, and they elected the dog and me. As a catcher? No, as uh, student senators. We oh, were both we were both elected at the same time. Uh, uh, so I was a member of the uh, student, me and the dog became members of the student uh, senate. I thought that was one of the greatest honors I'd ever received. Hey, I met my second wife at Madison, don't forget. You did? Uh, Kathy Watson. Uh, yeah. Uh, Randy Anon Anonymous. Her name. You met her there? Yeah. And uh, one when he went out to perform. And um, one other wonderful thing they did, and they, they had a postcard of that, they had a parade. They had, a they had all these uniforms, but they didn't have musicians, so they each took a transistor radio, and they got the student uh, radio station to play uh, marching music, and they all tuned on their, tuned in their, like 25 of them, tuned in the, uh, the station the to the marching music, and they marched down uh, around that central circle there, and uh, it was a wonderful idea. Hey, everybody loves a parade. So you remember anything else that happened when we were there? You got 30 seconds. We got 30 seconds to remember. No, that was pretty much a blur. It was the 70s, right? Uh, 1870, what? It was, uh, it was before, wasn't it before? It was, was it before this? It was before Gulf War Syndrome. Was it, was it the eternal now? It was in the eternal now, right? No, it was right now then. Then it was right.